Uh, this is uh, 1057, who maybe I shouldn't call Ryan Clark, but that is his real name. So please, uh, please give Ryan Clark a warm welcome. So I'm used to a, a much larger room, so I'm used to noise. So can you guys make a little noise? Say, like, how are you doing? Everybody good? Yeah. Give, the, give the Hackaday guys a, a hand again for putting this together and having us all out here. So can you guys see this screen OK? Yeah, we good? So that guy right there is one of the first projects I ever did for DEF CON a long time ago. I embedded a web server into a skull and I was, I was generating dynamic content through changing uh, memory directly with the microcontroller. Um, it had one of Joe Grant's Emic Texas speech modules on it. You could change the eyes, had light up LEDs and it would actually serve out a page showing the status of the skull and things like that. So that kind of set the stage for me because that was part of a contest they had called the TCP IP Embedded Device Competition. And when I showed up to DEF CON I was by myself and I didn't know anybody and I was competing against all these teams. And it really got my fire going about being active when I go to cons and things like that. And so like, I love the fact that we have all the activity going on because that's how these things should be. I also second the, uh, the comments that have been made earlier about I don't have to explain why I do certain things to people. But that's one of the most common questions I get through all of the work that I've done at other conferences is why do you do the things that you do? And um, that's kind of what I'm going to try and share with you today. So you guys ready? Yeah? All right, buckle up. Uh, quick side question. How many of you have been subjected to my form, bizarre form of math, uh, mathematistic masochism is the phrase, a few of you? How many of you have been to DEF CON and played in any of the challenges at all? So a few of you. Cool. So again, thanks to Hackaday 10 years. Oh, side comment. I'm actually running an in-talk challenge as we speak with prizes. So if you are so inclined and you feel the need to participate, I can't help myself. It's kind of in my DNA at this point. So that may be a hint that there are hints throughout the presentation. So when I first uh, was talking to Mike about what to talk about and what the title should be, um, I was like, uh, using crypto to save magic. What, what I meant by that is why do I go about doing this stuff is I feel like Google and everything else have, has taken a form of magic away from the world. Because as a child when I would see magic tricks and, and stuff like that, I would always have to try and figure it out in my head. How did this work? Whereas now I can just instantly go to Google and get that answer and have it fed to me immediately. And I don't go through that process. And that aha moment of figuring something out is I think a form of magic that is starting to go away. Or or change form. And we had an interesting discussion about this um, over dinner last night. And I really want, I'm going to rethink um, my opinions on that because I, the argument was put forth that maybe now we're just more, maybe now we're just more efficient at, uh, at that. I don't know. But my goal in all of the work that I do is to provide opportunities for that aha moment for other people. So why do I bother mocking around? Um, several DEF CONs ago, uh, I gave out golden tickets at the DEF CON 101 talks, which are for the people who are new to either hacking or the conference. And I forced teams that were competing in my challenge to adopt team members that they didn't know. So we had a lot of high school kids and a lot of younger kids and other people who had just never been there who were kind of intimidated. It's no secret that our circles, us, you are my, my my family, my, co my, my people. Um, some of us tend to be a little introverted, et cetera, et cetera. So what I did is I started forcing people out of their shells through the cryptographic puzzles that I was putting out there. And so one of them, one of these, and do you remember these crocs? Do you remember the golden tickets? So what I did is I gave out golden tickets after asking questions. And I would ask questions like, what number base would the Simpsons use? It's obviously octal, right? Because they got eight fingers, right? Come on. How, what, what number base would a pirate count in? That would be hexamol base six, five fingers and a hook. <laughs> so answers to questions like that would get you a golden ticket. And I only gave the golden tickets to people who were noobs, who were, didn't know anything about what was going on. Then I forced the other teams to adopt those people into their teams. And as far as I know, some of those people are still friends. Are you still in contact with? with so I like to think I created some friendships. 
so would you like to play a game? So that's more of a hint towards if you're paying attention. And I believe these are being recorded and put up somewhere. I will run this until like 10 people solve it and I will send out really good prizes. So. So a little bit more on me. My background is in mathematics, uh, linguistics, electrical engineering, and computer systems engineering. Um, I get bored easily. When I was an undergraduate, I kept changing majors when I would get to my senior year because I didn't want to leave school. Um, so I had gone through all of the coursework for an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering, switched to computer systems engineering, did that because it was pretty close. Went from that and did some physics for a while, and then went from that and did ma mathematics. So I'm kind of all over the map in terms of what my skill set is um, because I'm just interested in everything. I want to know how everything works. Um, like Quinn was saying, she's a programmer but wanted to know how the computer worked and I wholeheartedly support that. I think we have too many programmers who don't know what happens inside the box and I think if they understood that it would change the way they code. It would change the way that they think. And like several comments that were made, now resources are cheap. Memory is cheap. Well, if you were programming on a Motorola 68 HC11, it's like coding with one hand tied behind your back because you just don't have the resources. And it really changes the way you think about things. Uh, a little comment on the name. So 1057 is an evolution of the hacker handle Lost Boy, which was then shortened to Lost, which was then turned into Leet Speak by my fellow hackers, 1057, which happens to be a palindrome in binary. It was one of the solutions to one of the first challenges. Um, I really pride myself on being able to give people the answers to problems and not have them be aware of the fact that they have the solution. So in one of the original mystery challenges, the very first code that they, or comments that they got was off of an LCD, and I'll show you a picture in a minute. And the first phrase was, all is lost. And lost was a solution, albeit in binary. Good so far? So, the mystery challenge was an interesting product of the fact that I had competed in that competition where the TCP IP embedded device competition. And the following year, my goal was I was going to get a hat trick. I was going to go to DEF CON. I was going to prove to these hackers that I was their peer, that I was every bit as good as they were, that I didn't care that I was by myself. And so I started prepping a project for the following year after I won that first year. And the competition went away. So six months out from DEF CON, I started emailing Jeff Moss and saying, hey, where did this competition go? I want to compete in that again. It turns out that the guy who ran it, his name was Neural, and props to Neural for basically creating me. Um, he said it wasn't going to be run. So I said, well, to hell with it. I'll run it. And Jeff says, great. The problem was is there was a miscommunication and he believed that I was referring to the TCP IP drinking competition, <laughs> which is interesting given the fact that I don't drink. Um, so I went along and did all of this work prepping for that first year mystery challenge and then got really close to the con time and then was told, oh, they, the, the correction had happened. Somebody did a parody check on our vocabulary, I guess. And it turns out that no, I was not in fact going to be running the TCP IP embedded device competition, which is what the mystery challenge prep was all for. So I said, you know what, to hell with it. I'm a hacker and I ran that competition anyway. And I ran it and titled it the mystery challenge because it didn't really happen. It wasn't really at DEF CON. And an amazing thing happened. There's so much thirst and desire in the world for magic and the unknown and we're so fascinated by it that people like Joe Grand, who I was a friend with, and some other people who shall remain nameless for reasons you can ask me about afterwards in private, started talking trash to each other on several public open forums about how they were going to beat each other in the mystery challenge. Now at this point, none of those people knew what that challenge was. And it was interesting to me that this competition started resonating between people in these open forums and it drove people to have have interest in it. And so for the very first mystery challenge, I gave out these boxes. And the boxes themselves were just a piece of a much larger puzzle. I did things like, uh, for all that you were doing, all of you that have been doing lock picking here, um, I had things like I had three locks on them, but one lock was unlocked, so they would pick all three locks, and they were actually picking one closed at the time. I also took magnets that came from Intel, where they float the wafers when they're going to grow the silicon wafers, and I embedded those inside the box, knowing that most lock picks are ferrous. And so they would go to pick the locks, and the lock picks would stick to the side of the box. Uh, I did, so that's kind of, 
And there's a picture, and if you look, that's actually the first year that Joe did the electronic badges, and, there's a, and that'll become important later on. You can see him in the background. So I had these boxes on this table, and before I gave them out, I had a sheet over them, and I had blue LEDs on them, and so you could just barely see the LEDs blink into the sheet. People were like, what the hell is that? So when I, when I pulled the sheet off, it happened to be the same time that the fire inspector for the hotel was walking through the contest area to make sure that everything was safe at the time. And so that was the first time that the hotel thought that I was handing out bombs. <laughs> First being the keyword there. So, Mystery Challenge was started to take on a life of its own. I um, was requested that it come back as an official contest at DEF CON. So the year two boxes were giant steel girders that were cut, and I really liked the physical construction on these because um, it really foiled these expert lock pickers. I had taken these, these, these are steel tubes, that are about a half inch thick steel. And uh, we had soldered or uh, welded on the inside stops and put plates up against them and then put holes here and ran tubes through and then put locks through the tubes. And the way we kept them from just cutting the tubes, it was a tube within a tube. So one tube inside just barely fit and the other one was longer to go to hit the edges of that metal. And then I put the locks recessed down in so that they were, would only be at a particular angle so that the lock picks couldn't enter the keyway. So what they had to do was alter their lock picks. They had to hack their lock picks in order to get to the keyways to try and get into these boxes. But the worst part about it was there was a little bit of social engineering involved. And I had put mercury tilt switch sensors on these. And when I handed them out, I was very gingerly handing them to them, warning them, you cannot tilt these boxes because you don't know what will happen. It may prevent you from solving this puzzle. And he's smiling because he probably remembers this. And these were heavy. They were heavy boxes. And now there's locks on the top and there's locks on the bottom holding these tubes that are preventing you from getting in because then there's steel plates. So here you have people in a hotel taking these boxes with electronics and an LCD that says warning, warning, and they're carrying them gingerly through the hotel. <laughs> So you know what a hotel security staff is going to think, especially in a Vegas casino. The worst part is when the guard would come up to talk to him, one of the teams actually tilted it. The tilt sensor went off and I had a piezo element in there and it went meh, meh, meh. And so it freaks him out. So uh, that, that was the second time that, uh, that the hotel thought I was playing bombs. But it was the first time that the Hoover Dam thought I was trying to blow it up. Because interesting side note, in order to get those to the conference, I had to put them in the back of my car. And I had 20 of these and they were so much there was so much metal that they were weighing down the car. When I went over the Hoover Dam, I guess there's a weight sensor somewhere that they said that car shouldn't weigh what it does. They stopped me. They had me open the trunk and then said, you need to open these and show us what's inside. And I didn't have the keys with me <laughs> for opening those boxes. And it took two hours of talking to a guard at the Hoover Dam who thought I was driving bombs over the dam to get it off. But anyway. So the mystery challenge continued. Over the years, I've done things like um, I gave them an, a book. I'm, I'm a hand book binder. It's one of my hobbies. Uh, print will never die, I hope. Um, at least the art of hand book binding. There's something about holding a book, I think, that is also magical. And one year, I wrote cryptographic puzzles, a whole bunch of cryptographic puzzles. And I bound them in books. And throughout the books, there were these red X's. And the only clue that they had at that point was that the X marks the spot. And all of the X's that were in the book itself were printed in red ink. All the rest of the crypto puzzles in that book were a red herring. They were a misnomer. The X that they were, in fact, searching for was underneath the X Libris. How many of you know what an X Libris is? <laughs> Yeah, only a few people. So back in the day, books, knowledge, books were considered such a valuable possession that you used to put a nameplate in the front of your book it, um, that was the ex libris, Latin for from the library of, and then you would sign it. It was a way of marking that that book was yours and you could lend it to other people because a book was such a valuable item. So I had put ex libre, I think is the plural for that, in the covers of those books. So the ex I was referring to was the ex in Latin. And I had actually taken the covers of these books, split them and embedded a micro SD card in the cover of every book that they had to destroy to get the XD card out. So all of those puzzles that they had gone through to, with the X's throughout were red herring. 
So I continued on, and I'm leaving certain slides for a second because I see a few people writing something down. But I could go on for hours about this stuff, by the way. So Mystery Challenge continued to pay for it. It became um, a source of great joy for me to see people getting to have that aha moment. The, the moment of going through perilous th uh, work to try and solve something and then bingo, have that revelation of that epiphanal moment. Um, if I can take a side tangent for a second, I've spoken at a few conferences recently and I have this soapbox talk that I've been giving about the think outside the box phrase. I would like everyone in here to commit to never use that phrase ever again because it's a stupid phrase. And I'll explain to you why. There's been research and people have studied that if you have a motivational speaker, a lot of times they'll use the nine dot problem, which is where the phrase think outside the box comes from, where they give you the nine dots and they say connect all the dots without lifting the pencil. And it's usually, you know, can you do it in the minimal number of lines? And so most people mentally apparently impose the shape of a box to themselves. And so thinking outside the box, because you all know the ultimate solution is you go outside the lines and you can connect all the dots. However, studies have actually shown that they have taken groups and actually told them, you do not have to stay within the imaginary box and it still does not provide a greater percentage of people with the ability to solve that problem. They have found through this type of research that they believe that it is through exposure to knowledge, the time and the tinkering and the thinking about problems that leads to those epiphanal moments, that lead to those aha moments. Those of you who are true dyed in the wool hackers, figuring out a problem, it's not because somebody came and gave you some quippy little, you don't have to think outside the box. It's because you've studied the problem and you have a base knowledge of it and you have a fundamental knowledge base to pull from. And so I, I try and encourage people to be creative because I'm accused of that all the time, although I don't see it. Um, but don't be lazy. Don't be intellectually lazy. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Try things. When I was teaching at the university, it used to infuriate me when students would come up and ask a question, and my first response would always be, have you tried it? Have you tested it? No? Well, then don't talk to me. I don't even want to talk to you if you haven't gone out and tried it. Um, so the whole pay it forward, I, I continued to enjoy teaching and, and giving these puzzles out to the world. Uh, Martin Gardner was always one of my heroes, and I'd like to think that I was trying to honor him um, through some of the stuff that I was doing. This was, a, I had created Dante dollars for one of the, one of the contests, and uh, the serial numbers on the bill and everything else were actually very significant cryptographic clues to certain parts of the puzzle. Interesting side tangent. I learned a lot about the uh, constellation marking on bills. You're all familiar with that? How many of you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, go home, take a $20 bill, put it on your scanner, and try and scan it. And watch what happens. There, is, there are things in the firmware of your scanners, as well as in Photoshop and even GIMP, which really shocked me, that there are identifying marks on most major types of currency that will prevent you, for obvious reasons, because they don't want people going out and making 20s. And I learned all about that through trying to create these stupid $20 bills. Got the clever idea, hey, this is how I can kind of right protect my own pictures. And so I learned how to, to create those constellations myself and embed them in other images so when people try and print them out and or scan them, then it thinks that it's currency forgery and won't work. So just to register for the contest became a, a, a big thing. I, I used to announce, oh, we're going to have open registration and teams would send me information and they would register. At this point in, in the career of doing this, this game and this puzzle, I had people who were coming to DEF CON purely to do my challenges. They would come up to me and say, I only came to DEF CON to compete in this. And it became very serious for a lot of people. And I had too many people trying to register, so I had to create a registration round. And I wouldn't announce it. People would have to watch my sites, they would have to watch for STEG, they would have to watch for co covert channels of communication, whatever, to even figure out how to register for the contest. Um, for example, one year um, they went to one of my main pages and I had this code up there and those of you who are programmers will instantly look at it and go, there's not enough bits in each one of those columns. That's because this was actually the image title of that graphic was I love the 80s.jpg 
the dimensions of that image are 1984 by 1986 and it actually happens to be a cryptographic code based on the titles of movies that John Hughes had produced during the 80s. And the way they got that was if you went to any other page on the site, you got this 404, which says, with apologies, John. And the text there is all references to movies that John Hughes did during the 80s. Uh, uh, forgotten up your day off, Ferris Bueller, things you wouldn't be so weird, weird science, direct you on your way, uh, club you with my mad science. So uh, breakfast club, weird science, so you get it. So that was the clue to drive them to figure that out. That page is still up, by the way. So this is an undocumented or uh, undoctored photo of students blowing up resistors in my lab because when I would teach electronics, I would have them burn different parts to try and identify which parts had been burned based on smell. And um, so if you've never done it, if you've never done it, go home and blow some stuff up. It's cheap. Go to DigiKey, buy a bunch of resistors, different values. Um, be careful about it. You can get some amazing explosions just with uh, standard, uh, like we were using uh, power strips and just turning them on and popping them. But uh, so things were really blowing up. Um, Crux may remember this one. So this, uh, this was one of the stages where throughout the contest they had been earning pieces of a circuit. They didn't know what those pieces were for. Ultimately they had to build a laser transmitter and they had to transmit uh, text to, if you see inside this blue box I had a receiver and sorry that the, the picture didn't come out that well. They, they had to transmit with the laser a particular code which they also got from another part of the contest. And I had a little LCD readout on there that would change if they had sent the right code. What they didn't know was that this was in a, a contest area. I had an RF transmitter hidden underneath the table that was connected to this that when they actually transmitted the proper code, it sent an RF signal to a receiver that was in a complete other part of the hotel that was in the vendor area where I had put a fake vendor table. I made bull crap t-shirts that I was selling. I wasn't really there to sell t-shirts, but I was selling t-shirts and other stuff. And I had a mannequin head on that table that inside I had embedded a little video projector. And when they triggered in the other room, this video projector would turn on and start uh, showing video that was for the next stage of the contest. And so you had people in one room seeing this weird projector pop on for no reason, and you had people in the other room. And it's amazing that the physical separation was enough to destroy the association in their minds. And they took them hours to figure out that the two were actually happening, that one was causing the other. And so when they they, when they actually figured that out, they had a piece of paper that was also printed in reverse on translucent paper with the fiducial so they could line it up to the video image and it actually spelled stuff out for them on the sheet that gave them a phone number to SMS text me on my phone. So they, a lot of them were not happy about that. And I put, uh, I put numbers in both uh, Korean and Chinese and some of them in reverse. Um, at this point, uh, I started watching the web. People started creating tools just to combat my stuff. Um, people were starting to form teams. I started seeing comments like this out in the wild about uh, people started following my personal life. Social engineering went up. They started calling my wife at home. They had gone and dug up my personal academic history to see what I had studied in school. They had started contacting relatives. At this point, it turned very serious because people got so into the contest that they were starting to employ all of your hacker skills of picking out a target and using them on me. So, and, oh, here's another one. It also got to the point where teams were forming packs with each other because part of the game was also involving social engineering, another hacker skill, and they were social engineering each other. And it also got to the point where I had people forging things that I was doing, and I had to get to the point where I could, I, I could somehow watermark something as being from me because people were creating fake websites, they were impersonating emails from me, uh, completely forging fake identities that were supposedly me. Uh, to communicate with other teams and throwing them off the track. Complete to the point where one year we had an announcement of both team registration and uh, information about the badge, which I'll get to in a minute, that was complete and utter bogus information that was so well done that uh, Jeff Moss called me on my phone and he said, what the hell, we're not supposed to release any information yet. And I said, Jeff, you know me, I've got better security than that. And it, it was enough that it fooled Jeff, dark tangent. 
Um, I threw this in there in uh, for, uh, I forget the young lady's name that's doing the talk on turinary computer systems that's coming up. Uh, there, yeah, yeah Jesse, sorry, I forgot your name. So I threw this in there for you after we had that discussion. So the lanyards one year, the lanyards are also part of everything that I do because I want people to interact with each other. And so if I put stuff on the lanyards, they have to go up and talk to other people and they have to interact with each other. So this year, um, these obviously look, what do these look like to you older folks? They look like punch cards or turn tapes or that type of thing, right? Actually, all these are is they were ternary uh, numbers for decoding. And they decoded to this message, uh, which was just a riddle. The ox door closes, closer chases the green witch five minutes behind her, used to be Mary. Is that, anyone have any thoughts what that means that doesn't know already, Crux, what it is? So that was a reference to uh, Great Tom, which is a bell that used to be called Mary, which rings five minutes behind the Green Witch Mean Time. And it, when they ring that bell in Oxford is when they close the gate. So that's another example of some of the types of things that I throw into the work that I do. So, Mystery Challenge, by the end of its run, I had been doing it for five years, had grown from 20 or so odd teams to we would have several hundred teams compete for slots to get into the game. And then when I would run the game, I would have between 500 and 2,000 people at any point involved in the Mystery Challenge. That's the same year that Joe, who was a good friend of mine, decided he didn't want to do the badge design anymore. So Joe uh, and Jeff asked me if I would do the badges and if I would add some type of puzzle game to the badges because they saw the level of interest and fun and camaraderie that I was creating and the content that I was creating and they said, does that scale? And I didn't know if it would or not. And to make matters worse, at this point, Joe had been doing the electronic badges for five years. And every conference on the face of the planet had started showing up with electronic badges now. And we always try and stay one step ahead of everybody else. And so I was also posed with the challenge, can you do something awesome, like the mystery challenge, that's engaging, that scales for everyone at the conference, and be a non-electronic badge? That was a pretty tall order. But being the masochist that I am, I said, Sh I can try. And so the very next year, as a personal challenge to myself, I tried to scale into 16,000 people, much smarter than I am, a puzzle game that is both, now think about the parameters here. It has to be intellectually challenging, solvable within the space of three days, but not be boring to some of the brightest people I've ever met. That is a very unique problem set. And, and I had to learn new ways of thinking of both encryption, because my puzzles are everything from mathematics to linguistics to physics, social engineering, lock picking, physical security, you name it, I tried to throw it in there. And amazingly, it worked. The year that I did these badges, these badges were made out of titanium. We bought so much of this particular type of stock of raw titanium that we affected the price in the United States. Um, we did the titanium because we wanted them to be light and fun and it had to be an interesting material. I had done things like there were little nicks in the edges of the badges that looked like fabrication mistakes. Those were actual fiducials for keys for certain parts of cryptographic puzzles. So I had to work with what I had and uh, people tell me they enjoyed it. So um, with respect uh, to, to your build, this was a 15-foot floor decal that is a 4-bit microcontroller that I designed as part of a puzzle, and I gave them some of the ROM information down here. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, so I, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So this was on the floor, and they would have to sit and figure out what this thing was doing. First of all, recognize it for what it was. But for those of you who don't know how a processor works, I highly recommend that you go through the painstaking process, at least in software or in some type of simulation, to understand how a processor works, at least at a fundamental level. Do like a 4-bit microcontroller like this. It's easy to do with enough time, and it's not as complex as you think. 
um, there's your ALU and some pass through registers, etc. You'll notice that at certain places I have the little DEF CON smiley face. That was my clock signal. Um, I had done things like, like I had given them schematics that look like pirate treasure maps and stuff like that. Um, and just again, showing you some more of the information that I had given them. I had to let them see inside the ROM to try and figure out what this thing was doing because ultimately I had given them inputs here and this is from my memory. And I mean, keep in mind, this is 15 feet wide on a floor with foot traffic of 16,000 people going through there. And what was awesome was people were afraid to walk on it. And so they would be in the hallways and you would see this big row of people and people would be sitting there with paper and writing stuff down. And I eventually had to go and start shoving people on there. It's like step on it, walk over to it, walk through the processor, figure out how the bits work, figure out how a processor works. And a, a lot of people have, I think I'm probably going to do a write-up on that one. It was a lot of work. Uh, another one of these 15 foot floor circles, the reason I did this one, uh, you'll notice my use of foreign languages because I have this big belief that you're always just studying this communication, whether you're communicating to a processor or a, an assembler or to raw hardware or to another person, it's always just forms of communication. Whether I'm talking to a chip or I'm talking to a person, I see it as no different. Um, this one used, uh, anyone recognize those symbols? Know what those are? It's an ancient numerical writing system used in China, um, hence the Chinese that was there. Um, I drew it as a clock um, out of respect for that year's badges, which were actually PCBs that uh, the Uber badge had hand uh, clockwork mechanisms in them. My grandfather was a jeweler and a watchmaker, and this was um, kind of my homage to my grandfather. Um, for those of you who are interested, the PCBs that year were all done, also in the free version of Eagle. Um, I did that intentionally so that other people could try and reproduce it. Now, if you've ever, I'm not an artist, and trying to draw art in something like Eagle is a very new experience if you've not done it before. I also found very strange errors in Eagle. At one point, I had um, an error pop up that said, too many pixels in the X direction. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> and so I, being the hacker that I am, I said, okay. So I took everything and rotated it, seeing if I could create too many pixels in the Y direction. And apparently you can't. So. This was another 15 foot floor circle that if you were not paying attention, had a very subtle code embedded in it. Now, a lot of people stared at that and stared at that and stared at that and stared at that for hours. Because they were so engrossed in that, they missed that. <laughs> now, that code there tells you panogram. And if you go back to this, who knows what a panogram is? Panogram is like the quick brown fox, you know, sentences that use all the letters of the English alphabet and put them in one place. You'll see it often as a representation of a font. So if you write the quick brown fox, the traditional panogram across the top, this actually spells out uh, sentences for you. And the different colors were indicative of different words where they were. So again, just being very subtle. So as hackers, you have to be very observant, see what's going on around you. Um, this uh, following uh, on the free eagle tradition, this was the DEF CON 21 badge um, that I did. I took a little bit of artistic license. I designed it so that you could cut the bottom of the board off after the conference and have a working circuit on the top and have it be small and be usable in projects. Um, we gave out the VGA connector, PS2 connectors, and everything you needed to have basically a fully functioning development system in the badge that year. But being the interesting weirdo that I am, I also like to do things like, how many of you remember the old Alfred Hitchcock show? You're all too young to even know who Alfred Hitchcock is. I'm, I'm not that old, but I like mystery and things like that. So, it, do you see it? So, Alfred Hitchcock's head is actually embedded. And by the way, if you've never had interesting discussions with PCB fabrication houses because of weird crap like this, it's quite fun. Um, I would destroy rule checks all the time, like this, the skull badges. A lot of that was just the exposed copper. They would argue with me for hours. This won't work. I was like, what I needed to do is going to do. Doesn't, fa doesn't pass rule checks and it would just freak them out. I've had so many discussions with fab houses. It's not even funny. Uh, there's the back of the clock badges there. Um, you can see, uh, I wish the picture was better. So, uh, are we doing okay on time? I don't want to run, okay. So these, 
I hand did the clock mechanisms that were in these. I didn't make the parts like my grandfather did, but I got as close as I could. I ordered parts from across, uh, your word for the day is horology, which is uh, the art and science of making clocks and studying time. I ordered parts of mechanical watch movements and assembled them. I hand assembled all of the Uber badges. There were only 25 of them that year. And they were inset inside the PCB. So when I ordered the circuit board, I had a cutout, and then I put the clock mechanism in there. I soldered the, the brass nuts to copper pads that were exposed, and then screwed through to add tension to hold that mechanical watch mechanism in there. And then I glued watch crystal glass on the top and bottom. And this is actually the bottom side. You can see the glass there. But in order to test them, I had to wind them all up. So I wound them all up, packed them very gingerly, and hand carried them with me because there was so much work involved in these. And I was really proud of them, and I wanted to get there safe. And I, I'm cursed as far as TSA is concerned with my baggage. So I hand carried these through security. And I put them on the x-ray machine, and when they went through, because of the copper that's in them, and the way they were stacked, people were like, the TSA agent was like, could you pull that box off the belt? And when I did, they got close enough to it, they could hear that the watch parts were ticking inside. <laughs> so here is this guy going through airport security with a ticking box and being like, and trying to be careful with it too, again, trying to be gingerly with it. So I've had my share of run-ins with TSA on that. We uh, there's another one of the boards that we, so that's a PCB. That's a full-on circuit board. I bet you never saw a circuit board like that. <laughs> the board house hadn't, and they were really upset with me. They were like, what the hell is this? You've got silk screen, I've got some, saw, I've got some mask over some copper, I've got some exposed copper. So basically, my palette would be my silk screen, my solder mask, my bare copper, and my bare board. That, that was my palette each time. Um, oh, by the way, that year we did a deck of cards, and uh, Casey grabbed me my bag. So I brought some of the decks of cards, if anybody wants one. I brought like four of them, so come see me afterwards and ask me a good question or something. I'll give you a deck of cards. We only made like 200 decks. Um, I added cards. I changed all the suits that year to be like the rotary dial, the keyhole, et cetera, et cetera. And I added, instead of jokers, I had a hacker and a crypto card, so you could spell the word hack with the playing cards. So did I stall enough on that one for people to write, write down maybe something that might have been in blue letters on the side? <laughs> I'll go back one more time. You see, oh, by the way, this was Getty Lee from Rush. Notice his base right there. I did famous hackers on that deck of cards, too, by the way. Um, some, of the, some of the face cards are the lone gunman. Um, one of the face cards is the girl with the dragon tattoo. Oh, well, the press one of, oh. So I have a personal beef with the press. Um, as a hacker. Uh, so that year, all of the face cards were people that I respected, admired, or someone fictional that had to do with hacking, like I had uh, Acid Burn from the movie Hackers. Uh, I had Sandy Clark, Mouse, for those of you who know her, is an actual person. She was one of my cards. Um, the press was the only specialty badge that was not a face card, and they were a deuce. So. <laughs> Sorry. I know, crass humor, right? So, I've got Hours and hours and hours of stories. If you don't understand, I'm boiling down every single year. The challenges are anywhere between 15 and 45 steps of cryptographic puzzles that are layered with multiple paths to solutions. So it's really hard for me to boil that down into a talk. What I was trying to show is kind of how I, the, the palette I have to work with and what I try and produce for people. But ultimately, the end goal was trying to bring people together and to provide opportunities for people to have that epiphanal moment, the aha moment, where you've thought through a problem and solved it. I'd like to think that I've affected the lives of some people and created some friendships and learned a lot on the way doing it. Um, if you've never tried it, try reverse engineering a problem that you've got. Think of it backwards. If you're trying to solve a crypto, like so, try and have a crypto solution for something, try and think of a way to cause it to be weak so that it can be broken. And in so doing, you may find a solution to the problem that you didn't, hadn't thought of already. It was one thing for me to go, okay, I got four days, three days, how do I make crypto breakable? and still fun and not because you know it could be easy to just encrypt something to the point of just being stupid where they just have to brute force it like one year uh, I did a one-time pad and the key to the one-time pad was a chapter in a book how many of you are familiar with there are several books written that never use the letter E yeah 
It's that kind of thing. That's the kind of stuff I like to throw in because I'm weird like that. Uh, lipogram is a good word for you who don't know it. Look up the word lipogram. It'll send you on another path. Um, so that's all I had planned to talk about. I, I ask anyone I could talk about this for hours. I'm happy to answer questions at this point about why I'm crazy and do this stuff. That's it. Do we have time for questions? Time for a yeah. couple minutes for questions. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. So you have a challenge going on right now. I do. So, it's funny you should say that. As are with most of my challenges, the answer to that question is embedded in the challenge itself. <laughs> How many of you have played, uh, have played the game Mao? <laughs> no, okay. I, that's all I can say about that. Any other questions? Come on, ask me a stupid question. I don't care. I got, pri I got decks of cards or something. Yeah, what's your question? How many times have you made your challenges too difficult? So, that's a question I get a lot. Um, I always shoot for 50% success and 50% failure, and I'm usually pretty close. Uh, some years it's more like 70% will solve. I've had some years where only about 40%. I have never had one where teams have not solved, and the reason that is, is I troubleshoot the crap out of my process, and I provide multiple paths to solutions. I will tell you what my favorite thing is though, and that is when a team finds a solution to a problem that I didn't think of. Because I will have a, um, every year when I do these things, they're multi-staged, I have these flow charts with arrows that are going from stage to stage, and I verify that there are multiple paths to a solution, at least four that are connected. Um, and it blows me away, over half of the time, they will come up with a solution I hadn't thought of. And that dumbfounds me. Because I'd like to think, I'm, I'm arrogant, and I'd like to think I'm pretty good at doing this at this point. I've been doing it for over, you know, for over 10 years now. And, it's, and it, I learn from them every year, and I watch them, and you can ask Crocs and anyone else who's played my games. I am down on the floor with them when they are working through these challenges, and I talk to them, and I ask them questions. What are you thinking about? Why did you do that? Why did you approach that problem? And I'm learning what their processes are as hackers and engineers and scientists, and it, they're just impressive. The people that beat my stuff, I, they're way smarter than I am. I'm just an idiot with a soldering iron and a math degree, so yeah. So I will tell you, here is a major hint for this one. This is the Hackaday 10 year anniversary. Okay, so um, I have used base six, which is hexamal, base 16, hexadecimal. I've used base 60 because of the Mayan calendar. I have used uh, base three, base two, well, and, and if you want to be nerdy about it, it's a radix, so radix is, what your base is. Um, what is the strangest I've seen people try? 1057. And write code to go up to that. Now think about that. They had to have some type of representation f up to that point. Yeah. Like I have seen some crazy stuff. And I've seen crazy stuff where they will find solutions. Oh, by the way, I met my wife through doing this. Yeah, she's a gifted cryptographer. She used to break my codes on visual inspection without paper a no code and got to the point where multiple teams at several different challenges were Skyping her into the conference a year she didn't come. And they didn't know that she was actually working two teams against each other <laughs> at the time. But, uh, and I have to give it up for, she's, she doesn't like to be in the spotlight much, but she helps with the art and the design, and she's also one of my beta testers to make sure that stuff just isn't, because it's not fun if it's stupid hard. We also call her when we're competing together because she's better at it than we are. But it's not, it's no fun to get up against a problem that you see no progress on, but you have to turn the wheels. And that's a very fine point for, and it's different for some people. Some people don't have the patience to sit and look at a problem and to work through it. And so I'm part of the other reason I'm on the floor. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, there's two groups at DEF CON that were up all night long, every single year. It was me and it was the guys running the OCTF and we would be down that contest area. I used to sleep underneath the table in the contest area so that I was accessible 24 seven. Well, one year I had to do it because people were hitchhiking me and actually trying to break into my hotel room. Um, I've had that happen. But anyway, I made myself accessible to them. One year I had a team get uh, bugs 
microphone bugs and plant them on the table so they could surreptitiously listen to conversations that I was having with other teams. So I've been bugged, I've been broken into, I've been social engineered, and these are live at the conference. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they offer bribes all the time, money. No <laughs> torture. Any other questions? I think I'm way over time, but yeah. You guys want a real quick uh, way to get around the no-fly list? I probably shouldn't tell you. You know, you guys know how to bypass the no-fly list, right? It's really easy. You know that at the point that you go through, they check ID and they check ticket, and when you go up to the gate, they only take the ticket. So all you have to do is buy a ticket under an assumed name, get a fake ID, go up to the thing, show the ticket that matches the ID, go through that point of the stage. They don't check ID at the gate. Go up with the one that has your actual name on it if you want to, and you get on the plane. So anyway, <laughs> not that I'm in. <laughs> Anyway, one last question. That's it? Yeah. yeah. When you begin to put these puzzles together, how do you pick references? Do you, do you look at whether they're super esoteric or not esoteric enough? I don't. I start, I carry a little, and I, for, in, in my bag, wherever it is, I carry a little pocket notebook around with me, and every day that I think of something interesting or new, I write it down, and it takes all year long to get ready for the next year. And oftentimes, I think of things already into a design for a year for the following year. Um, I also get ideas when I watch them solving and I've used that against them because a lot of times they will dismiss a solution is not possible because they tried it in previous years and it didn't work and so I'll use that against them in following years. Stuff like that. Anyway, thanks guys. I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards. <laughs>